In terms of wound assessment, I'd like to really discuss the importance of that because, as you know, consistency and technique is very, very important. Wound assessment, as I mentioned, is very important for a number of different reasons. One of the things that's absolutely critical is that we need to be as consistent in, as possible in our approach to wound assessment. We need to also make sure that there's consistency among providers. That is very, very important because if clinician A sees a wound and documents that wound as a vascular ulcer, and clinician B says, well, no, I think that's a diabetic ulcer or I think it's a pressure injury, that can be very problematic. The other area where that can be difficult is if clinician A says, well, the wound is 3 by 5 centimeters, and the second clinician says, well, no, it's 5 by 3 centimeters. That really does become problematic, so it is extremely important that there's consistency among providers. Wound assessment should be comprehensive. You're not just looking at the wound in terms of the color. You're not just looking at the wound in terms of the location, but it's a very comprehensive assessment where you're looking at multiple parameters. It has to be done at routine intervals, and a lot of this will be dictated by your place of practice, but as a good standard of care or as a good rule, wounds typically should be assessed at the moment of admission or as soon as possible as a patient is admitted to your, your facility or your office or your clinic or your practice setting, and at routine intervals. So what does that mean? That at least weekly, there should be a comprehensive assessment on that wound, looking at some of the parameters such as the location, the size, the depth, the quality of the tissue. We're going to talk about all that here in just a moment. But all of those need to be documented, assessed and documented on a regular, consistent basis. And as I mentioned, the documentation is really going to be the cornerstone for developing your plan of care, for enhancing communication among providers, and also for justifying reimbursement. So let's look at this wound assessment model. When we're looking at assessment, these are some of the different parameters that are very important to take into consideration when you are looking at any wound, um, not only for the first time, but again at regular intervals. We are looking at things like size, location, whether there is pain or infection present. What is the condition of the peri wound? By peri wound, what is the condition of the tissue immediately around that wound? Because that's going to determine sometimes whether a wound is getting worse or better, or it may help us determine our dressing change choices. The exudate, is there a little, is there a lot? What is the character of that exudate? What do the wound edges look like? And what type of tissue do we have? And then finally, dead space. Is there undermining or tunneling in that wound? That's very important to address as well. That will also be very important in determining how you're going to manage the wound. So this is just a model to give you an idea that when you're looking at a wound, you're not just looking at a hole. You're looking at something that is very, very important, and you're looking at the anatomical depth, and you're looking at all of these different um, parameters in order to, to accurately determine how you're going to manage that wound and how you're going to care for that patient. So as I mentioned, location. Um, as any realtor would tell you, location, location, location. But when we are assessing a wound and documenting it, it's critical. It seems like a no-brainer, but it is very critical to document the location of the wound. That's especially important if a patient has more than one wound. So location, is this a sacral wound? Is this on the right ischium? Is it on the left ischium? Is it on the medial ankle? Is it on the lateral aspect of the heel? Be, be as clear and as precise as you can in terms of describing the location. Um, that is very, very important because that can certainly be a cause for, for great confusion among clinicians. So be as precise and as clear and, and as anatomically accurate as you can be when you are describing the location of the wound. The right butt isn't very helpful. If you are describing the, um, the uh, right ischial process, that would be important, or the um, sacral or the right medial gluteal area. Those are more specific than just right buttock. So try to be as precise as you can. The size. 
Size is very, very important. And one of the things that's very important to keep in mind is that when we measure size, size is always with respect to the orientation of the patient. So the length of the wound is always measured from head to toe. And the width is always mentioned side to side, regardless of the shape or, or um, characteristics of that wound. So length is always head to toe, width is always side to side. In some cases, wound tracing is used by some clinicians. Um, I don't really see that being done as much anymore. It is certainly something that may be an option in some environments. Photography is another way to help with uh, trying to quantify the size of the wound. There are certainly some uh, different types of um, software programs that will allow you to take a picture and in that picture calculate the actual size and in some cases the uh, surface area of that wound. Photography is uh, certainly a very, very helpful component in really being able to see the wound and see the wound progress over time. So it certainly has a lot of advantages. You know, if you have a wound that's been present for five or six months and you have beginning and, and final pictures, it can really help you appreciate the progress of that wound over time. The thing that is very, very important to keep in mind is that from a documentation perspective, it is absolutely essential that your photography and your documentation match exactly. Because if you have a wound that's covered with eschar and you're describing it as a granulating wound, that could be a very uh, difficult issue. The photography is going to be very facility specific. Some facilities have a, a policy in which photography is part of the standard of care, and in other facilities, uh, photography is not necessarily included. There's no wrong or right about that. The important thing is just making sure that if you are in a facility using photography, please make sure that your photography, that your pictures are matching your written uh, or your computer documentation. The depth of the wound. So again, many of these wounds, these chronic wounds are not two-dimensional. We have length, we have width, and we also have depth. And when we're measuring the depth of the wound, the best way to do that is to use a sterile cotton-tipped applicator. And basically, you're going to insert it perpendicularly into the wound. And you're going to, again, determine how deep that wound goes. And you're going to measure that. So tunneling and undermining are also important concepts. Not only is the length and width and depth of the wound important, but also you really need to be looking at whether or not you have uh, dead space. And by dead space, what we are referring to is either tunneling or undermining. And by tunneling, what we're referring to is a tract uh, or tunnel that is in the wound. And in some cases, it may, uh, you may have a patient that has one or more tunnels. Whereas undermining refers to um, the edges of the wound not being attached. And with undermining, you will typically have like a shelf or um, a lip, if you will, uh, where you can slide the Q-tip in and you can see that the edges are not attached. And I will go ahead and demonstrate that for you. Hello. One of the things I'd like to do is spend a few minutes to demonstrate the concepts of undermining and tunneling because those seem to be issues that a lot of clinicians struggle with and really have some concerns about what exactly those mean. When we talk about tunneling and undermining, those are really a type of dead space that we see in the wounds. One of the things that we do as part of our comprehensive wound assessment is to look at the length, the width, the depth of the wound, and also for the presence of any dead space such as tunneling or undermining. When we talk about tunneling, a tunnel is generally a tract in the wound. It usually is, is one directional. Using this particular uh, mannequin, I would like to just demonstrate what tunneling looks like. So whenever you're assessing a wound, you're going to be using a sterile Q-tip. Typically, if I am going to be measuring the length, the width, and the depth of the wound, this patient's head would be at 12 o'clock. The feet would be at 6 o'clock. So I would be measuring the length this way head to toe orientation. I would be measuring the width this way, side to side orientation. And then I would be measuring the depth using a sterile applicator and finding the deepest part of the wound and holding it perpendicular to the base of the wound. And that would allow me then to determine what my depth is. That's pretty straightforward for most clinicians. But when we have tunneling, tunneling is generally a tunnel or tract. And in this case, 
I have a patient who has a tunnel. This is a patient, his head is here. Therefore, if I am using the face of the clock, which is what you would use to describe the orientation, this would be a tunnel that measures approximately three and a half centimeters, and it's located at about the seven o'clock position. So we have a tunnel at the seven o'clock position. That is a tunnel. In terms of undermining, undermining really refers to an area where the edges of the wound are not attached. There is basically a shelf or a lip underneath the wound. So to measure undermining, what I would do is again use a sterile tipped applicator and I would find, and you can see as I hold this Q-tip parallel to the wound, that it goes right in and there is a little shelf or a little uh, lip if you will. So in this case, I am finding that there is undermining from here all the way over to here, quite a bit of undermining. So what I would use, again, is the face of the clock, and I would describe this as approximately, oh, two centimeters, I would say, of undermining from about the 11 o'clock position all the way over to the two o'clock position. So that is undermining, this is tunneling. The other thing that's very important, just to reiterate, is whenever you have any depth or dead space in the wound, it's absolutely critical to pack that wound, not to overpack it, not to pack it too tightly, but to just gently fill those areas. That's a very critical part of your wound care. Thank you. So in addition to tissue type, we also need to look at what, what are we looking at with the wound? What kind of tissue do we have in this wound? Do we have necrotic tissue? Do we have healthy tissue? It's very, very important to try to determine what type of tissue is in that wound. And a lot of times what I will say is, if it ain't red, it's dead. And usually what you're wanting to see in a wound is a nice, healthy, clean wound without the presence of necrotic tissue. And with necrotic tissue, we're usually talking about eschar. Eschar is usually the dark black, brown, gray, sometimes leathery textured material that we see in a wound. It's usually associated with a wound that's been allowed to dry out. And slough or fibrotic tissue is more of a kind of a yellow, yellow stringy type of a tissue that sometimes you will see within the wound bed itself. In any case, if you're, even if you're not clear on how to document, if you document necrotic tissue, that certainly is very, very appropriate, and then try to describe it to the best of your ability. The thing that's very important also is that you want to document the tissue according to percentages, because wounds are not going to be necessarily 100% necrotic or 100% granulating. The wound on the top, for example, is 100% necrotic. And what we're looking at there is some eschar along that right lateral margin and some, uh, some fatty necrosis and slough in that wound. That would be 100% necrotic. The wound on the bottom is 100% granulating, very, very clean. But if, for example, that wound on the bottom had a lot of slough in it, maybe covering about half the surface of that wound, then I might describe that as being 50% granulation, 50% slough. So it's very important to just try to uh, eyeball that wound and try to quantify the amount of tissue in the wound. Is it 75% necrotic, 25% granulating? Is there 10% slough? Is there 90% granulation? Try to be as, as precise as you can. Because again, as you are assessing a wound, one of the things that's very important is you want to be able to determine the type of tissue in the wound because that's also going to guide some of your topical therapy. And if you have a wound that has necrotic tissue and that necrotic tissue is slowly decreasing over time, that certainly is an indication that that wound is progressing or improving and that's a, a positive parameter that you're looking for. The wound edges, are the wound edges even? Are they uneven? Are they flat or are they rolled? And by even or uneven, with certain types of wounds, the edges will be very round and very even. For uh, example, some types of pressure injuries or some types of arterial uh, ulcers will have very even round punched out edges. In some situations, the edges may be very irregular and very, very uneven. It may look like perhaps a rat has gone in and chewed the edges of the wound, very, very irregular. And sometimes we will see those in some vascular wounds, such as venous stasis ulcers. You also want to look and see, are the wound edges flat? And that's very, very important because if the wound edges are flat, um, that is 
a very important parameter because, again, flat edges are what are going to resurface and come across that wound. Unlike your rolled edges, and we talked about this previously, the epivoli where you have the uneven edges or you have large uh, elevated uh, margins on the wounds, that wound is not going to resurface without some type of intervention to address that. So it's very important to be able to look at the condition of the wound edges as well as everything else we've talked about so far. Exudate. Exudate's important. You want to describe both the character and the amount of the exudate. You may want to describe it, for example, as there's none. It might be a very dry wound, in which case you have no exudate. You might have a scant or minimal or moderate or, in some cases, copious amounts. That is a little bit of a subjective assessment, but it is very, very important to try to quantify that as much as you can. The reason why that's important is that if you have a wound that has a lot of drainage versus no drainage, those different types of parameters are really going to affect your dressing choices, your choice for appropriate topical therapy. So the amount of exudate is very, very critical. You also want to describe the character. Is it, is it a serous? Is it serosanguinous, where you have a little bit of a blood tinge? Is it frankly bloody or sanguinous? Is it purulent? You know, do you have frank pus coming out of the wound? Or do you have, you know, kind of a yellow, creamy tinged drainage that you're not quite sure about? If you're not certain, again, describe what you're seeing. Try to describe the amount and the character. For example, a minimal amount of serosanguinous exudate or a copious amount of serous exudate, or a scant amount of purulent exudate. Very important to try to describe both the amount and the type that you're seeing. The peri wound area is very important because not only are we looking at the wound, but we want to also look at the condition of the skin around that wound because that's also going to influence some of our treatment choices and our topical therapies. We might want to assess for induration. As I mentioned earlier, induration is a firmness or resistance. When you palpate that area, it's firm, it's kind of hard, it doesn't feel as soft as the regular tissue. And when we see induration, that may be indicative of either underlying infection or sometimes additional tissue damage or tissue injury. So it's important to document the presence of any induration. Is there redness around the wound? Do we have erythema? Erythema may be a result of, again, a chronic inflammatory process. It may be some early cellulitis that's developing. It may be some irritation from a dressing or perhaps some, some friction going on in the wound. So you want to document that. Do you have maceration? Maceration is um, very, very important because if a wound becomes macerated, it really can lead to further damage to the peri-wound area and actually in some cases make the wound worse or make the wound larger. And in the uh, picture on the top, maybe a little bit difficult to see, but this is a gentleman who has uh, a 16-year history of a chronic uh, MRSA infection that has been very, very resistant to antibiotics and he has had copious amounts of serous exudate coming from his wound, which has made wound care very difficult. But the other problem is that it creates a lot of maceration. It causes the intact tissues to be very, very moist. And if the intact tissues get too moist, it causes further erosion or breakdown of the skin. So think about that in terms of maceration. Another way that you can think of about maceration, if you're trying to describe it to a colleague, is if, you get in, if you're doing some dishes and your hands are in the water for a prolonged period of time and you pull your hands out and you see that your fingertips are kind of white and pruny, that's maceration. It's just the intact tissue is overhydrated. And if it's not treated, it can cause further breakdown. Is the peri wound intact? That's ultimately what you're wanting to see. You know, is it, is it intact where there's no redness, there's no irritation, there's no open areas? Um, or is it denuded? Denuded or denudement really refers to some partial thickness breakdown of the peri wound area around that wound. So, for example, if we look at this wound on the bottom, you can see that centrally we have a full thickness necrotic wound. If this were a pressure injury, which it is, we would say that that was an unstageable pressure injury.
And then as part of our documentation, we would also be describing that a lot of that peri-wound area is denuded or eroded. Um, again, if the wound is denuded, that's going to have an influence in terms of how we're going to treat that wound and care for the patient.